Okay, so our second speaker is Lexa Shrevenak. Lexa recently earned a PhD in geology from the University of Florida. As an NSF graduate research fellow, she investigated geologic evidence preserved in fossil coral reefs across the Caribbean for the response of sea level and ice sheets to a past warm climate and developed outreach activities to support evidence-based discussions on coastal resilience in formal and informal educational settings. Lexa is a policy analyst in NOAA headquarters with the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Oceans and Atmosphere, focusing on topics related to coral reef conservation, reef health, and Indo-Pacific marine protected areas. So her talk today is titled Coral Reefs, Coastal Change and Resilient Communities, and I will turn it over to Lexa. Thank you so much, Amanda, and thank you to all for joining us today. Uh, as you can see in the animation here, coastlines are dynamic places with dynamic ecosystems and often, unfortunately, stationary human infrastructure. So on that note, I'm speaking with you about corals and coastal change today because in 2012, something happened that really changed the trajectory of my life and the way that I think about coastlines. The 40% of Americans live on the coast, my family included. Coastal counties were an individual country. Its GDP would rank third in the world behind the US and China. New York, my hometown shown here, has the second largest coastal population of about 16 million people. So in 2012, Hurricane Sandy hit this area. It resulted in $70 billion in damage, making it the fourth costliest storm behind Katrina, Harvey, and Maria. Sea level rise of approximately one foot over the last century contributed to a storm surge of up to 13 feet in lower Manhattan. As you can see in this image is out of power as a result of that coastal flooding. So in the aftermath of this, uh, this event, several questions were posed, such as when will coastal flooding like this happen again? How high and how quickly will sea level rise be occurring in this region? And how will it amplify a storm effects like surge and coastal flooding? So those of you working on sea level, and coastal planning know that these are, are simple questions to pose, but not necessarily simple questions to answer. And that is because sea level in and of itself is especially complicated. It doesn't rise or fall uniformly across the Earth's surface, but is driven by a myriad of local processes, such as vertical land movement due to changes in surface loading and tectonics, or due to ocean circulation piling up water in different places and non-uniform distributions of heat or meltwater from polar ice sheets around the Earth as it rotates on different time scales, all of which come together and cause local sea level or relative sea level records to depart from global mean sea level trends. And that's illustrated well here, where we see sea level trends represented by tiny arrows for tide gauge records of local sea level across the US. As you can see in many places, it is rising, such as the eastern seaboard of the United States. But in other places, such as the Gulf of Alaska, those purple arrows are, you can see that sea level is falling as the Earth's surface, the land is itself rising relative to the sea surface. So my exploration into coastal resiliency and sea level change really begins here with New York. And the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy inspired me to get out into the fields become a geologist and search for evidence of how those sea level processes that I just showed you interact in response to Earth's climate in the past in order to improve model projections of future changes. So I'll begin by describing some of my dissertation work and afterwards, uh, time permitting, I'll discuss how this relates to my present fellowship projects. So I'm excited to share the results of my work over the last five years of, at UF namely inferences of last interglacial sea level variability from circum-Caribbean fossil reefs in collaboration with several colleagues in the US, Mexico, and Jamaica. And this is about one to two fifths of my dissertation. An example of one of my field sites on the north coast of Jamaica is shown here, where we could literally walk along reefs preserved in coastal limestone formations. Primary motivation for this work is to understand the sensitivities of the ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica to sustained global warming. While polar ice sheets are expected to remain dominant contributors to global mean sea level rise during the 21st century, 
projections may underestimate the magnitude and rate of future sea level rise due to assumptions about the link between global sea level and global temperatures in the past, as well as complex processes involved in rapid ice sheet retreat. For example, we don't know if ice, sheets, ice sheet melt will be rapid or continuous. So deciphering ice sheet response to a warm climate is necessary to improve predictions of future sea level variability. To work towards this goal of understanding past ice sheet response to warming, I reconstruct sea level change in a past warm climate by evaluating sedimentary evidence of past sea level position preserved in coastal deposits in the tropics, which is a bit counterintuitive. And these deposits include fossil coral reefs that are preserved in limestone outcrops around the world today. So, as you can see in this image, um, we have Acropora or Acropora, uh, Pormata. But in the fossil record in Jamaica, we see the same branching coral framework. So, shallow coral reefs are very sensitive to small changes in water depth and can grow right up to the sea surface, like these corals here. We can examine fossil reefs for evidence of gradual or abrupt sea level changes. The elevation and age of corals that once grew near the sea surface can be precisely surveyed and determined with U-series geochronology, respectively. And U-series geochronology is a radiometric dating technique. And this is to reconstruct position of sea level. It's possible to do so over the past several hundred thousand years. But we also consider other aspects in order to reconstruct past sea level. For starters, we have to snorkel the modern reef and study um, coral assemblages, as well as the depths that they tend to be found at in the region to calculate what some of the paleo water depth of the coral that we are observing in the fossil record. So you can see in this diagram on the right, we have age on the x-axis and elevation on the y-axis. Those points there are representing the age and elevation of two generations of reef growth shown on the left. They're superimposed on one another. So this is what we would observe in the fields. But, and the gray above those points is representing the paleo water depth at which those corals grew based on the types of corals that we observed um, in those outcrops. But and this is representing past sea level change, but we don't simply connect the dots in order to reconstruct sea level here. We also evaluate sedimentary deposits in addition to reefs and evaluate transitions between them to see was reef growth continuous in response to past sea level change or was it interrupted by perhaps sea level rise or fall in between two peaks in sea level. So as you can see in the diagram on the left, the corals in the reef one, the lower phase of reef growth, grew, then were chopped off at the top, they were eroded. Sand was deposited on top of it. And then eventually a second unit of reef growth occurred. So we can use this to more confidently reconstruct sea level on the right by inferring that there's a first peak in sea level allowing reef one to grow. Then the sea level fell, allowing the sand to cover that reef, eroding the lower reef. And then sea level rose again, allowing the higher reef to form. A unique aspect of my approach is that in addition to these sedimentary observations that I'm making in the field, I also evaluate alteration, diagenetic alteration of fossil coral. In other words, how well it is preserved for two reasons. First, well-preserved coral skeletons are necessary to determine accurate and precise age measurements. Secondly, I also evaluate the preservation history of the corals that I'm looking at in the field to help interpret the history of exposure and submergence. So as you can see on the far right here, I get to slice coral into tiny, tiny chunks and make thin sections to look for millimeter scale evidence of past sea level changes. For example, composition, morphology, and chemical composition of cements that precipitate within the fossil coral can provide evidence of exposure. So I look at these as well. Now, to get to the last interglacial. There has been a regular cycle of cold glacial periods and warm interglacial periods over thousands of years for about the last million years or so, which is in sync with changes in Earth's orbit. The last interglacial that I'm focusing on is the most recent warm period before the last ice age when ice sheets retreated beyond their present position. So during the last interglacial, which occurred about 129 to 116,000 years ago, global average temperatures were similar to a pre-industrial baseline or up to about one degree higher. Carbon dioxide 
concentrations in the atmosphere were also comparable to pre-industrial values. But unlike the present, carbon dioxide was not forcing warming during this time. Small changes in insulation due to orbital forcing or the way in which the Earth orbits around the, around the sun resulted in polar warming and restricted ice sheets relative to their present configuration, raising global sea levels by six to nine meters or 20 to 30 feet above its present position, flooding much of South Florida, as you can see there. Many early lasting true glacial sea level studies tried to see if peak lasting true glacial sea level matched with peak insulation inferred from those orbital cycles, but now we're asking more detailed questions. Such as whether or not sea level is changing on shorter thousand year, hundred to thousand year time scales. Or in other words, was there more than one peak in sea level during a past warm climate? And for a dynamic ice sheet behavior. So more than one peak is referred to as suborbital variability, and I'll use that term to describe more than one peak uh, moving forwards. So there have been many global mean sea level reconstructions for the uh, last interglacial based on the age and elevation of fossil coral reefs, and many show at least two episodes of reef growth, like that diagram that I just showed you, interpreted to be a response to two peaks in sea level. But they disagree with regard to the occurrence of suborbital or meter scale sea level fluctuations before the onset of the second peak. So I test whether or not a rapid sea level fall occurred during the last interglacial high stand by evaluating sedimentary evidence of subaerial exposure in last interglacial reefs or exposure to the air and response to sea level fall, and also by considering differences in preservation between generations of reef growth exposed across the Caribbean and the Bahamas. So we'll begin at the Florida Keys and travel to Jamaica, the Yucatan, and the Bahamas to view last interglacial reef exposures where there is new and previously published evidence for subaerial exposure. So one form of evidence that we use to identify subaerial exposure in the sedimentary record is an ancient lithified soil horizon overlying reef units called the calcrete. So in the Caribbean, a significant contributor to soil formation is a plume of iron-rich Saharan dust featured in a reddish-brown tan color uh, in this model of satellite data for aerosols from last year. The plume propagates westward from the African continent, contributing clays and iron dioxide to Caribbean soils, giving them a reddish color. So we drills cores of last interglacial reefs in the Florida Keys and observed not only a red soil horizon at the tops of the cores on the surface that we were walking on, but a red calcrete layer in between reef units below the surface. And so here are diagrams of those cores here. And the formation of a calcrete in between either two generations of reef growth, shown in dark blue, or between reef growth and coral rubble, shown in light blue, provides unequivocal evidence of subaerial exposure in the two cores on the right from Key Largo. It's also a pocket of red sediment in the core on the left from Lignovitae Key. We see a clear difference in preservation above and below this ancient soil horizon in all cores, including observations of changes in coral mineralogy, freshwater cements within the coral framework below that exposure that are not seen above it. We also observed two superimposed phases, phases of freshwater cements within the corals on this millimeter scale, interrupted by a marine cement, which is consistent with two periods of subaerial exposure. However, the cements were too small to be dated, unfortunately. Finally, borings into the surface of the soil horizon in the Key Largo core KL2, situated between two reef units, clearly indicate that the coral was exposed and then inundated. So these abrupt changes in preservation, cement uh, precipitation, and coral assemblages with elevation suggest subaerial exposure. But it's a bit of a plot twist here. Aegis suggests that reef units above and below the calcrete form during different orbital cycles. And the transition between them, that red exposure horizon, the red soil, represents a sea level fall during an entire ice age over thousands of years between two warm periods. So not helpful for my hypothesis. But I illustrated this uh, story here to show you the kinds of evidence and the level of detail that we're looking at to search for evidence of past sea level changes from fossil reefs. So I did the same thing in Jamaica, went out there, evaluated multiple reef units separated by a sharp erosional surface, truncating in situ acropora heads. Here in this image, you can clearly see two main episodes of reef growth separated by that erosional surface represented by a dashed line. 
But like the Florida Keys, ages indicated that this sequence that we observe here is in response to sea level changes on thousand year plus time scales. So again, not helpful for testing my hypothesis. But on the eastern coast of the Yucatan, we finally see abrupt changes in stratigraphy and taphonomy or preservation consistent with a sea level fall on shorter thousand year time scales within the last interglacial warm period. So here the excavation of a theme park revealed transects of two superimposed reef tracks dated to the last interglacial. In this image, there are about six meters of vertical exposure of patch reefs separated by Acroporus cervicornis um, infill in the lower reef lagoon that abruptly transitions upwards into a sediment tolerant coral and algal assemblage. So in this vertical transect above uh, of the previous image, you see evidence for two different reefs with reef crests shown in red and a model of a typical reef tract is shown below that for your reference. We see literally two of these stacked on top of one another in this location. In previous studies inferred a backstepping reef architecture based on the relative position of the two reef crests shown in red and the areas with seemingly continuous reef growth from the lower reef into the upper reef shown here. The relative sea level interpretation is that sea level rose rapidly from three meters up to six meters above its present position, resulting in the sequence of reef growth. I went there to see if there's any evidence for a sea level fall prior to the rapid rise. And first off, there is evidence of erosion of the highest points in the lower lagoonal patch reefs and reef crests. Again, similar to the previous examples, there's a clear difference in preservation between the lower and upper reef tracts. Cements in the lower reef tract indicate two episodes of subaerial exposure and inundation of the lower reef not seen in the upper reef. So we have a clear difference in preservation between reef tracts resulting from variable exposure to freshwater and discontinuous erosion of the lower reef consistent with a small sea level fall of about a meter, truncating or slicing coral at the highest points in the lower reef, and resulting in discontinuous reef growth from lower elevations. I also went to the Bahamas because there are well-dated observations of multiple last interglacial reef units here as well in response to two peaks in sea level, but there were no survey measurements or elevation measurements. So I went there to survey and evaluate the context for those ages from previous studies. And this information is featured in NOAA's um, NCEI for reference. So this is really exciting because in San, uh, Salvador and Great Inagua, Bahamas, we again see two superimposed phases of reef growth separated by an erosional surface. At San Salvador, the surface truncates a lower reef of in situ Acropora palmata. But what's interesting about it is that those Acropora are completely filled in with sediment, suggesting that they grew, but then something happens, say sea level fall, the coral were then filled in with sediment. Sea level rose again, eroding that now lithified sediment and coral, and then rose sufficiently high that a second phase of reef growth occurred. At both sites, the eroded lower reef is overlain by coral rubble that is laterally variable in thickness and extent prior to the second onset of reef growth. And in one part of the exposure at San Salvador, Apologies for technical difficulties. Shown in the top right, we see that the rubble is replaced with a layer of shell-rich sand, providing compelling evidence of a small sea level fall in between two peaks in sea level, allowing that sand to bury the lower reef before sea level fell, arose, allowing the second reef to grow. So the ages from this location indicate that the timing of this transition from the lower to the upper reef in response to changes in sea level occurred in the middle of the last interglacial warm period. But previous studies inferred a rapid spike in sea level at the end of the last interglacial. We observed that the highest coral within the second higher upper reef unit seemed to be growing sideways 
in a sense, sprawling like the one shown in the image here, indicating that they were growing at a very shallow depth during the final stage of reef growth at this location, which is inconsistent with previous interpretations of a late peak in sea level at the end of the last interglacial. So reviewing this information in a global context, at all sites we observe at least two episodes of reef growth, sedimentary evidence consistent with and or indicative of subaerial exposure of the lower reef due to sea level fall at all sites. Compelling evidence for sea level fall during the last interglacial warm period include the sand layer in San Salvador in the Bahamas, while that red ancient soil horizon in Key Largo separating reef units, uh, is also definitive evidence for a sea level fall in the fossil record. Ages suggest that that is representing sea level change on longer timescales, not the shorter timescales that we're considering here. But there are other observations of different reef units in both Jamaica and the Florida Keys that highlight the potential for evidence of last true glacial sea level changes at those sites as well. So the story is not over. Next steps figuring out the ages of these different coral where we see evidence of sea level fluctuations during this warm period in order to determine rates. So something that we want to know moving forwards is when will sea level rise and how to certain points and how quickly will it do that so that we can best prepare coastal communities. So this is something that we also need to reconstruct in the fossil record by obtaining reliable coral ages in order to reconstruct past sea level histories and also to correlate sea level records with other types of climate records to evaluate causes and mechanisms for various changes in the Earth system during this warm climate that we can use to better predict future changes. It's difficult to test hypotheses regarding the timing, duration, and potential causes of a sea level fall during a past warm period from the sites described here with evidence of severe exposure due to alteration of fossil coral resulting in poor age control. While rates remain unconstrained during the last interglacial, one such explanation for the history that I'm observing here is that of ice sheet dynamics, such as Antarctic ice sheet regrowth, concurrent with Greenland ice sheet melt, which is predicted by coupled ice and climate modeling study by DeCanto and Pollard, resulting in two peaks in sea level separated by a brief moment of sea level fall. As I mentioned earlier, the last interglacial is the most recent period when polar ice sheets retreated from their present position, giving us an opportunity to explore dynamics of ice sheet retreat and sea level rise at a time when the configuration of ice sheets was similar to present. And what these records tell us is that increasing Earth's temperature by as little as one degree can commit us to meters worth or multiple feet worth of sea level rise. I mentioned earlier also that unlike the present, differences in forcing mechanisms, such as solar insulation and changes in CO2 concentrations resulted in peak temperatures that were not attained simultaneously in both hemispheres during the last interglacial. But that is not the case today. Today, both hemispheres are warming at once. So this work indicates that we have yet to see the full effects of a warming world on global sea level. That said, geologic records of last interglacial sea level can be really evaluated to understand dynamic ice sheet behavior, response to a warm climate that can inform model predictions of future rates of global sea level change and ice sheet retreat. Additionally, further analyses of such spatial patterns and the magnitude and rates of sea level rise will help us to improve the boundary parameters in ice and earth models used to calculate current rates of global mean sea level change and reconcile various local records to get at those global trends including the timing and source of meltwater contributions. Therefore, in summary, new constraints on past ice sheets will improve calculations of modern rates of sea level variability. So what happens next? So final note before we take questions, I want to say that you know, just as reconstructing past sea level requires a holistic approach, so does planning for it. And modern coral reefs are a part of the solution in some places. So along with their wealth of biological diversity and aesthetic value that coral reefs provide, they also have substantial economic value. Reefs serve as barriers protecting many coastal populations and developments from storm damage. They also support commercial fisheries, serve as major tourist attractions, and really hold the possibility of unimagined med uh, medicinal compounds and the diverse life forms within them. Healthy reefs 
can absorb 97% of a wave's energy, which buffers shoreline from currents, waves, and storms, helping to prevent loss of life and property damage. Coastlines protected by coral reefs are also considered to be more stable in terms of erosion than those without, and this is documented in a study out from 2014 referenced below the diagram there, which suggests that 3.4 million is the value that reefs provide every year to us, benefiting fisheries, tourism, and coastal communities. So as part of my fellowship work, I'm lucky to be collaborating with the Marine Protected Areas Center, the National Marine Protected Areas Center, working on uh, partnerships between Indo-Pacific Marine Protected Areas to enhance marine protected area stewardship through information exchanges and mutually beneficial activities and to build capacity for ecosystem-based management, planning, research, conservation, education, and sustainable community engagement in these wild spaces. So we're working to develop sister sanctuary partnerships and cooperation frameworks to carry out joint activities featured in marine protected areas, which will include conservation and restoration of coral reefs, incorporating them into planning for coastal resilience. And with that, I welcome any questions or comments and feedbacks from you as I continue to work on reefs and coastal resilience throughout my fellowship year. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lexa. That was awesome. Uh, we do have a question. Have you considered how coral bleaching may affect future observations? Yes. So I mentioned a study on the importance of reefs to coastal communities. Healthy reefs can uh, provide really robust, barrier, robust barriers against wave action by creating friction. So corals are very complicated environments. Uh, they provide a lot of friction on the top because of the dynamic way in which corals are structured. Um, reefs that are not healthy will not provide as much friction as they could slow down waves before they hit the coastline. So it's in that way that coral disease, which is a, a national issue, can hinder the reef's ability to protect coastal or provide coastal protection. Thank you. Um, if there are any more questions, I'm going to give everyone about 30 seconds to type those in. And if you would instead like to reach out offline or if you remember a question you have at a different point, um, this is Lexa's email. Lexa, is that email correct? I believe your last name starts with an S? That is correct. Okay. So, um, I don't have any more questions that I'm seeing right now. So with that, I'm going to give everyone about four minutes back in their day. Thank you for joining us. These have been recorded and will be posted on the library's YouTube channel if you would like to pass them on to a colleague or if you missed a part of one and would like to revisit it at a different point. Thank you all and have a wonderful rest of your Thursday.